Please welcome Taylor Negron. I was born in Los Angeles in a house in a canyon that was in a nest of palm trees that casted these thin, unmoving shadows like prison bars. It was very California Gothic. <laughs> I am very California Gothic. I am the child of those people that you used to see in the ads for cigarettes in the back of Life magazine those handsome people that were always wearing terry cloth robes and, and penny loafers, smoking cigarettes, looking like they just heard the funniest joke of their life. <laughs> the Marlboro man met the Virginia Slims woman and had me. <laughs> it's very California Gothic to have your best friend's mother, who is a movie star, keep her cracked Oscar in the kitchen next to the salt and the cumin and the cumadin. <laughs> it's very California Gothic to see Joan Didion crying at the wheel of her green Jaguar on Moor Park below Ventura. It's very California Gothic to have a cousin who is a rock star. My cousin is Chuck Negron, the lead singer for the group Three Dog Night. And he bore a startling resemblance to Charles Manson. <laughs> now, when you were a kid like me in 1970, growing up in Los Angeles, you knew that you, that you shared the city with Charles Manson and his family. Because that grisly, murderous night of mayhem and helter-skelter was all anybody could talk about. And for those of you who are too young to know what helter-skelter is, it's um, kind of like twerking, but with blood. And <laughs> it was really scary. Really horrifying. And, and my parents, they were always going out on the town. They were always getting dressed up and leaving like in Mad Men, right? They just left me alone. They just went out. One night my father came in and he said, um, I want you to close all these doors and windows. I don't want these hippies to come in here and de-gut you. You heard him. <laughs> that was an option in my childhood to be degutted. <laughs> and, it, and it left a tremendous psychic scar on my life that has stayed with me forever. And, I, and I'm still very disturbed by, by, by hippies and long hairs and, and headbands and large candles and beads and bandanas. I just don't like any of it. <laughs> but um, I was only 12 years old. I, 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 was, I, was a, I was a tween. I was a changeling. I was changing into a man. But childhood is a, is a place where your fears are disproportionate. They're huge. But then so are your goals. And, and that's where the magic can happen, in these goals. And my goal when I was a child was to own a gorilla. <laughs> um, or, uh, you know, a monkey or an ape, anything from the monkey ape gorilla family. I just wanted someone to, uh, you know, be able to play hide and go seek with, um, swim, uh, shoot dice, um, light ironing. And uh, my parents were these really emphatic kind of ghetto people from New York City, right, who didn't like animals at all. 
And my mother said, look, you will never, ever see a monkey walk through that door. <laughs> but something very magical happened <laughs> that Christmas of 1970. You see, my uncle Ishmael, that was his real name, Ishmael, he was a trucker, and he had... His, he had his own flatbed truck, which meant that he could follow other people around who had flatbed trucks and pick up what fell off of theirs. <laughs> and one day he was closing down this raggedy ass Circus Vargas in the Hollywood Bowl parking lot on Highland, and he came across a monkey that somebody was throwing out. <laughs> a live monkey named Carol. <laughs> two R's, two L's. And we knew it was called Carol because it had its own cage with its name on it. And that is what changed the deal in with my parents because they are emphatic New Yorkers. So they said, well, if it's, if it's free <laughs> and it comes with a cage, what harm can it do? <laughs> well, Carol came to the house. I was so excited. Carol arrived on that flatbed truck on a pile of grapefruits in his cage. And when I went out there and greeted him, and I looked into those big round eyes, I knew that, that I would understand everything that monkey had to say to me. And that I would ir uh, experience unconditional love. Well, the monkey promptly squatted, shat into its hand, and then threw it into my eye, <laughs> underpaw. <laughs> and from the shadow, I heard the ice clink in my mom's drink. <laughs> and she said, that's your monkey. I loved my monkey so much, and I stuck with my monkey while everybody turned against my monkey. <laughs> Sometimes they even put a sheet over its cage. I stuck with my monkey when my monkey willfully and intentionally fucked my grandmother's mink hat, <laughs> and I took the blame. Carol was my most cherished early Christmas present. But Carol was not the only unexpected visitor that season. One Christmas night, the Santa Ana winds blew too hard against the glass in cold, frightening Los Angeles. I had fallen asleep into a deep Christmas sleep, and I looked out the window and I saw a van pull up in front of the house, turn off and just stop. Nothing happened for 30 minutes. Nothing happened. And I thought to myself, this is it. This is my nightmare, it's going to come true. And I thought to myself, well, at least I made it to 12. Then I looked out and, and, and the door opened up and then finally this plume of smoke rolled out and these hippies came out on wobbly feet and started slinking up to the front of the house. And as the cast of Woodstock approached, I, I, I felt vulnerable in my, in, in my Charlie Brown sleeping t-shirt. And I waited for the physical and emotional attack to begin. There was a knock on the door. And I heard my mother's voice muffled. I, I knew she was dead, throats cut. I, I, I had read the papers. But then I, I heard her say, grilled cheese sandwiches for everyone. Why was my mother giving protein to a serial killer? 
And then it was a, a blast as my father came into my room and he said, your cousin Chuck is here, come down. And I timidly followed my father down the stairs to see in the living room what appeared to be Mama Cass Elliot, Jim Morrison, and assorted long hairs devouring Christmas cookies. My cousin stood shyly holding a Three Dog Night album at the stereo, and he told us he was going to play a song for us that no one had ever heard before. Side one, song A. Jeremiah was a bullfrog, was a good friend of mine. I never understood a single word he said, but I helped him a drink of his wine. And on that cold, windy night, everyone stood up and started to dance. My, my, my father grabbed my mother and they started to dance. I looked over and Jim Morrison, the Jim Morrison, was dancing the jitterbug with my grandmother on the coffee table. <laughs> it was so extraordinary, it was so magnificent. The hippies and the long hairs were all singing along to choruses of joy to the world, all oh, the boys and girls now. And then the song was over and someone picked up the needle and put it back at the beginning and the song continued and the dancing continued. And there's something emblematic about certain California Christmas memories. And, and, and here is one that is transcendent, rock and roll. And this is what made my monkey legendary. He came down, <laughs> hurtling down the stairs and went right up to the stereo and started dancing. <laughs> Had we forgotten? Carol was a circus monkey. And this was her cue. You know I love the ladies. Her arms, his arms outstretched like rubber bands, and he, he started picking off the ornaments from the Christmas tree. Love to have my fun. The monkey started to juggle. I'm a high night rider and a rainbow flyer, a straight shooting son of a gun. I said a straight shoot. I wish you were all there to have seen the expression on those stoned... <laughs> on it, we found out later, LSD. <laughs> hippies, and my, grandmother, my grandmother as Carol, my monkey, rightfully claim the spotlight. <laughs> glee is a very good word to use because that's what it was. Pure happiness and glee because I was 12 years old and I was alive. <laughs> and I had escaped Manson's knife. And I had a monkey with talent. <laughs> and as everybody danced, and as everybody laughed, and as everybody ate cookies, I looked at my family, I looked at these people, and all of their crimes, past, present, and future, seemed to just spill out and dissolve into the contours of the blue shag rug. <laughs> and as Carol balanced an ashtray on his nose. It was as though I was looking into my future because I realized all the glorious things that could happen with music and with joy. And that Christmas, the last one that I was ever a child, I learned a very important lesson that I'd like to pass on to you all tonight. And that's that no matter how horrible your day is, and no matter how scary your night is, everything can turn on a dime and with a knock on the door. Thank you.